Okay, so we're almost ready to get started. Let's do that thing we do. And let's, uh, let's roll the intro. Hello, space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. Okay, space fans, welcome back to Astronomy 1020. Uh, today we're going to continue our journey with relativity. Um, I figure do a little bit of this lecture on cleaning up the scraps of special relativity and then maybe even indulge ourselves in a discussion of general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. The nice thing about talking about general relativity is it will position us well for our final week of lecture, where we can talk about the death of stars, supernovae, white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes, all the things you signed up for. So, excuse me, uh, let's get right into it. In our last lecture, we derived a important formula, or we kind of derived an important formula um, that is one of the consequences of special relativity. And uh, this formula is called time dilation. Uh, do I have a good slide for time dilation? Probably not. It's sometimes hard to find. Okay, maybe we'll go with this one because this is about as good as they come. We considered um, a pair of observers in a moving train performing a funky kind of experiment where they fire a photon from the bottom of a car. And sometimes people put a mirror on the top of a train car and bounce the photon up and down as if it was the ticking of a clock. While the train car rides past an observer who stands in a train platform. And you'll remember that the observer on the train platform actually watched the laser beam travel along a diagonal path because the light was being carried forward along with the motion of the train. The fact that the two different observers see two different paths or distances taken by the photons means that the two observers will likely see, will likely measure different times for the event of the photon going from the bottom to the top of the car. Why do two different distances imply two different times? because Albert Einstein proposed in his two postulates of relativity that the speed of light must be exactly the same for all observers, no matter what their relative velocity is. And this violates the Galilean transformation of velocities. Who the hell out there remembers what the Galilean transformation of velocities is? Oh, shit. It's like pouring water into a colander, guys. Galilean transformation of velocities. See, I need to use some fancy words like that, and I need to know that at least somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. No? Nothing, huh? Is it velocity A is equal to velocity plus velocity B? Yeah, it just means that if you're an observer on the train platform, well, it means normally, yeah, that there's, there's a reference, reference frame speed. And then there's, remember, the, remember what we did when we had the guy on the skateboard throwing the tennis ball? There was a guy on a skateboard throwing a tennis ball at two meters per second. And an observer on the ground watching the skateboard go by will see the speed of the ball as the speed of the skateboard plus the speed of the ball. That's the Galilean transformation of velocities. You add velocities together. I, Thought I had a slide of that somewhere. Whatever. Let's go ahead and let's get into speaker view and let's take some notes. So you will remember last time that there were some postulates of special relativity. Einstein began by saying, I'm gonna presume these two arguments are true. 
we're going to see what the consequences are, and then we will test and experiment those consequences to see if they agree with nature. So let's make a listing here to start off our class of some of the consequences of special relativity. Maybe we'll even do a little review of the sample problem. Consequences of special relativity. Now, I built this up slow last time. If you missed last uh, uh, Tuesday's, this Tuesday's lecture, I highly recommend you go and watch it so you get some, some good buildup to where we are at today. The consequences of assuming these postulates of relativity include the one we spent uh, most of our class on last time is time dilation. And the mantra of time dilation, sorry, my autofocus is going nuts, Time dilation, each, each one of these consequences has a little phrase associated with it to help you understand the basic idea. And time dilation's mantra is moving, moving clocks, clocks run, run slow. slow. That's right. But there was an aspect of this we, we didn't quite get into uh, last time, uh, a nuance perhaps that I would, I would like us to consider, all right? So, Today, I'm going to be expressing our relativity formulas in terms of a, a special relativity whack factor called the boost. And you'll remember that in almost all of these formulas, there is a parameter known as the boost. It's the symbol gamma, and we define it in the following way. It is triple equals defined as 1 divided by the square root of one minus V over C squared, where V is the speed of the reference frame that is moving with respect to you. And if that sounds too garbly gooky, the V is the velocity of the skateboard. Uh, remember that in relativity, all of our problems come from this effect. I think maybe a slide would be helpful here. In relativity, all of the issues come from the fact that there are two reference frames. Here's a nice groovy slide, slide eight. There's an observer who is <clears throat> quote unquote at rest. They're the person standing on the ground or maybe the person standing on earth. And then there is a reference frame that's moving with respect to it. This reference frame could be a skateboard. It could be a train car. It could be a star flying away from earth. It could be a whole damn galaxy. Anything that moves and you want to measure a velocity respect, with respect to that is a moving reference frame, okay? Now, the mantra, the, the apparent mantra for time dilation is moving clocks run slow. And all of the running slow is going to depend upon the speed of the reference frame. Unfortunately, in this slide, they call it U, but we're just going to call it V to keep things simple, okay? Sometimes, instead of writing V over C, we can simply write V over C is beta, and beta is just the frame speed. It's the reference frame speed as a percentage of C. So you will remember that we didn't actually have to plug in C last time, because in almost all relativity problems, the velocity is given to you as a percentage of the speed of light. And that means, Sometimes we can, we can write the boost in a slightly better to look at form, which is gamma is one over the square root of one minus beta squared. I like to write it that way because the V over C gets a little clunky. Basically, beta is where you put in your 0.5 C or your 0.6 or your 0.7, whatever your percentage of the speed of light is. What is gamma? Gamma is your special relativity whack factor. It is the factor by which times are going to become dilated. It is the factor by which uh, lengths are going to be contracted. Uh, although I constantly forget to download it for some reason, uh, the internet has a nice plot of gamma somewhere. Usually it takes me a minute, so uh, special relativity, uh, the boost. I forget what I have to, 
to plug in here to the image search to get this, but they have, oh, plot. Uh, let's see if we can find, uh, I always have to poke around for this, but there's, oh, this is it, relativistic speed. This is right from Wikipedia. So let's grab that here and let's look at this slide. This is great. Okay. So let me just walk you through this graph because graphical data is an important part of all science courses. On the x-axis in this graph, we are plotting the velocity as a fraction of the speed of light. And so your options are 0% the speed of light at rest or all the way up to the speed of light C. And here on the y-axis, we're plotting our gamma. That's the boost. The first thing you're going to notice that the boost is always one or more. It can never be less than one. It's always one or greater. And you will notice where you've lived most of your life at speeds well below 10% the speed of light, the boost is essentially one. And that means that you don't notice any time dilation when you're driving to stop and shop. Uh, sometimes I have a little sample problem with a hypothetical professor driving to CCRI at 90 miles an hour in the morning, completely hypothetical scenario. And I ask students to calculate the boost and it invariably yeah, completely hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is no, no resemblance to actual people or events uh, in your daily lives. Um, so uh, the boost always comes out to one. Maybe if I'm a little paranoid about time today, but we'll see. Maybe I'll have time to do that. It's actually a useful exercise your first time around. Now, right about here, guys, this is the mark where your velocity of your reference frame gets to be about 20% the speed of light. This is what is considered by most physicists to be the, we call it the relativistic regime. The relativistic regime is where, okay, now a normal person would start to notice some wacky shit going on with time and some wacky shit going on with length contraction. Uh, above 20% the speed of light, clocks are gonna noticeably run slow. That's where your gamma starts to grow. And what's terrifying is as you get closer and closer to the speed of light, gamma suddenly stops messing around. As you get up to 90% the speed of light, gamma just really quickly goes from two to three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to infinity at the speed of light. And that's where things just get bonkers, okay? Uh, if you got to see that, and by the way, there's gonna be gravitational equivalents of this too. So gamma being uh, above, the speed being above 20% the speed of light is a good marker for when does relativity stuff kick in? We'll keep that guy handy. We might need him later. Uh, calculating the ah. gamut is so important that I may have us do that again as kind of a refresher, especially for those who may have missed our lecture last time. Okay, so now that I've gotten to remind you about the boost, the special relativity whack factor, uh, actually, can I just take a moment? Does everyone have this into their notebook? This is critical. Ah. Yes. Make sure you got that because I want to erase it. Not yet, not yet, Got give me a it. second. That's cool, I gotta drink some iced tea. Whiskey. Whiskey comes afterwards. I can wait till 2 p.m. to start drinking like a normal person, okay? What but just point barely. is it iced tea? Depends, have you been waiting or have you been drinking all night? <laughs> like, what's the fun in that? I plead the fifth as I am on the court. <laughs> Okay, I'm good. All right. Uh, let's see here. I just want to erase the boost stuff. Okay. Now that we've had that talk about the boost, let me write the time dilation equation in terms of the boost. The concept behind the boost is this. Since all of the relativity stuff depends upon our velocity, let's just tuck all of that nastiness into the boost, and then the formulas will become easy and we can sort of think about the complexities of relativity unencumbered by calculator punching, okay? So time dilation would be T is equal to gamma times T rest, okay? Now in these two scenarios, T is what is known as the observer time. The observer is usually, but not always, you. You're the scientist or the astronomer on Earth watching some weird stuff happen in outer space at high velocities, 
And that means that you're trying to calculate the time that's, that's happening for you, the observer. The rest time, and I'm going to be very particular about my language here, class. The rest time is the time elapsed in the same frame as, and I'm going to use some tricky language here, the same frame as the event, okay? The same frame as the event. What is the event? The event is the thing that you are trying to measure. And believe it or not, with, especially with time dilation, it can become very confusing what the event is. Sometimes the event can be kind of abstract. You have to be able to specify what the crap is it that I'm actually trying to measure and in whose reference frame is this thing. The time that happens in the same time as the event so, is the rest time. Now, so, uh, Marcus, one more thing before I let you ask your question. When I did my setup on Tuesday's class, I called the observer time TA, and I called the rest time TB, where I had the following scenario. There was a train platform, and the observer A was standing at rest on the platform, and then I had a box car which was moving relative to A at some velocity V, and there was a laser beam being fired in the box car from the bottom to the top of the box. Okay, that was supposed, the rest time is B's time. Now, Marcus, ask your question. No, it was, uh, uh, well, it was, who was, who was that? Nate, Nathan. Oh, I'm I was sorry, just Nate. I gonna say, no, it's all good. Well, I was going to say, so when it says the time elapsed in the same frame as the event, it, that means there's like um, a cap to the time that's respective to the observer time. Uh, what, did so you like, say a cap? Yeah, yeah, yeah like, like, a big, like the, the time signifying the beginning and the end of the event is time from the observer time. Oh, uh, right. uh, hold on. It, talking about these things is complex. So let me see if I can rephrase your question. Um, there, there is a, a time change, a delta time. And I think, I think what you're saying is, you're saying that observer B has a, so for observer B, there is a start time and there is an end time, right? To the event, yeah. Right, and I want you to think of the start time and the end time as like a delta T. But what people do is they get tired of writing the, this is gonna sound confusing, but they get tired of writing the delta. Uh -huh. So they just write it as TB. Because if you think about it, all measurements of time are like an interval, right, Nate? You have a start yeah. to your stopwatch and a stop to your start watch. So all times are in a sense an interval. Rather getting overly confused because A also has a start and an end time, right? A has mm. a T start, which is when the laser gets released, and it has an end time, which is when the laser beam gets captured. And that's delta T A. So I'm just worried that your question got muddled, Nate, because you were talking about start and end times, where I'm saying, okay, yeah, well, whatever, start and end times regardless, there is a delta TA and a delta TB, and those are both intervals. So do you want to try to rephrase your question, or did I answer it? I feel like I was more like saying, is the event more like a period uh, that is respective to the time being used in TA? Oh, it's a interval. I would not say period, because period is what we use for planets going around the star or something. Okay. I would say it's an interval. An interval is, a, in fact, an interval is an important concept in relativity, but it's a basic idea for mathematics. An interval is, it, it is a distance between two points on a number line, right? Like, mm -hmm. look, dude, if I put one clip of my fingers at 60 centimeters, sorry, I'm doing all this backwards, 
and I put one clip of my finger at 40 centimeters, the coordinates are 40 and 60, but the interval, the interval is 20, shit, I can't do this backwards. The inter, interval, the interval is 20 centimeters. Yeah. Do you see what I mean by the term interval? Yeah, I'm, I get it. Okay, so both of these times, Nate, are intervals. But forget about that for a second. Just imagine them as times. Let's keep it simple. There is a TA, an observer time. There is a TB, which is a rest time. And let me help flush out this concept of the event. Because I think, now that I think about your question, this is what you're asking. Let's draw our picture one more time and do a, uh, do a simple thing. Because it's going to pay off here. Let's draw the picture from the perspective of A and B. So this is, the, this is the start of my experiment, and this is the stop of my experiment. At least from the point of view of observer A. Observer B is not aware that observer B is in motion because observer B is traveling at a constant velocity. And that means that they don't experience any acceleration or deceleration forces, they can, argue successfully that they are in fact at rest and that it is the rest of the train platform and the rest of earth that's moving past them. So for B, the start and stop of the event is the laser being released and the laser being captured. For A, the observation is of the laser being fired along a diagonal as it travels from the bottom to the top of the cart along with the motion of the cart. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why B constitutes the so-called rest time is because if I asked you this question, Nate, in whose, well, first of all, I'll ask, uh, focus. Goddamn autofocus, okay. Uh, Nate, what is the event in this case? What is being timed or measured? The, uh, how far the train travels. False. Completely false. What is, uh, what is being timed with your stopwatch? The light returning to the top of the train. The, the time it takes the laser to go from the bottom of the car to the top to of the, the car. Can yeah. we all agree that that's what's being timed? Yes. That makes sense now, correct? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So in whose reference frame is the laser beam situated? Uh, T B B B's frame, yeah. and that is why B constitutes the rest <laughs> time, because the event is how long does it take a laser to go from the bottom to the top of a car, correct? Yeah. And okay. B is in the frame of the laser. The laser is stuck yeah. on the cart. Okay. Does that help you understand what the rest time means? Yeah. Wait. Anyway, if you were going to say who's moving, you'd all probably say B, right? Well, for, forget about that crap and forget about that nonsense. At constant velocities, nobody's moving. Everybody's moving. Motion is relative because each observer can argue that they are at rest and it's the other observer, who, the other observer who's moving. That's why I said okay. it depends who you ask. It depends who you ask. I think we could crystallize this with a sample problem, okay? We did this last time, but let's just try another one. Okay. Observer B fires a laser from the bottom to the top of the car. Let's have observer B travel at 90% the speed of light. Let's say that observer B measures a time of three seconds for the laser beam to go from the bottom to the top of the car. How much time will elapse for the laser to travel from the bottom to the top of the car according to A? How long does it take according to A? How do I do this, class? Let's get into some real shit today and let's just do a sample problem right out of the starting gate.
Okay, what do I do? Uh, using the formula for the boost. Now you're talking. Let's calculate the boost. So the boost. you should have you should have three on top. Uh, no, let's just do the boost first. Oh, okay. Trust me, there's a reason for this. Okay, yeah, no. So it should be one over the square root of one minus, that should be the 0. 0.9 squared. Excellent. Okay, everyone punch it in. See if you can handle that. I showed you guys how to do that last time. I don't know if you remember. What you get? Three point three. Not three point three. Is anyone actually trying to punch this in? I got two point three. That's what I got too. Nice. Okay, our boost is two point three. Riker, do you want to try that again or do you want to see it done? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the see it done because I forgot how to punch it in on. Okay, hold on. Wait, let me get my phone. Hold on a sec, class. I, I'm sure that some people missed this last time, so we're going to do it again. We got to do this slow and right, okay? I don't, I don't want to do this half-assed. Okay. You all ready for the magic? Uh, where do I do this? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, one minus 0.9 squared equals. That's the inside of the square root. Okay. Now, shift square root. That's the bottom of the division bar. Now I'm gonna flip it with my reciprocal key. Okay. Shift one over x, 2.3. That help, Riker? Yep. Okay. Okay, so let's answer the question. How long does the event take according to A? According to A, it would take 6.9 seconds. Or about seven seconds, right? Yep. Okay. The mantra for time dilation is moving clocks run slow. Whose clock is running slow, A's or B's? Uh, B, because he's the moving one, right? Well, actually, you said uh, it doesn't, it's different now. Yeah, Wait, which clock is the slow clock? We have to discuss that. A. A. Why, no. No. Okay. That's what I was worried about. All right. Uh, I need to oh. explain to you why A is the fast clock and B is the slow clock. We have to talk about this. Let's use green for A. We should color coordinate this. And let's use blue for B. Okay, one clock is three seconds. The other clock is seven seconds, right? Oh, now I see why. All right, explain it, Riker. Prove to me that you understand. So the it's the fact that for uh, observer B, in this particular instance, three seconds forward, whereas for observer A, it has moved seven seconds forward. Okay, so keep explaining. I want to really make sure you understand me. So when we say a moving clock runs slow, 
the the longer time means more time has passed, whereas the shorter time means less time has passed. Maybe I could say this a little more succinctly, uh, Riker. Hold on, let me get my pinky quick here. I'm in a pointy stick kind of mood today, okay? The clock that's running slow is the shorter interval or the shorter elapsed time. Because guys, the confound is normally when you think of fast or slow, fast implies velocity. This is a garden path linguistically. If you're a runner on a racetrack, one runner runs in three seconds and the other runs in seven seconds, who is the fast runner? The runner <laughs> with the shortest time, right? That's how you're used to thinking about times and speed. But in this case, it's the opposite because we're not talking about how fast does a runner run. We're talking about the rate of time of the needle flowing around the clock. If both observers measure the same event and this needle gets to the seven and that needle only gets to the three, then the needle which got to the seven is the faster flow of, we're talking about the flow of time. Here, only three seconds has elapsed in flow, and here, seven seconds has elapsed. Does that help? Yeah, it's, it's like the, the twin paradox. With it, the, the twin brothers. paradox is based on this. But yeah. hold on, I've got a couple of more hidden reveals for you guys. But first, I just had to make sure that you understand that most people think of B as the moving frame and B's clock is running slow because the rate of time, the time flow is moving slower than the time flow for A's frame. I need to also remind the class, if you were observer B inside this hyperspeed train, you would not psychologically experience your time as being weird. You would not feel like you were running in slow motion like this. You would feel like the rate of time was completely normal. What would happen is if you looked out your window back at A, his time would be all fucked up. Your time is always going to seem normal to you, okay? And let's try to ask that question next because Here's the real heart of relativity. What we've done so far is honestly just the preamble. This next question is the real question. I'm gonna write it out because it's important to think about it slowly. For the same exact experiment, here's my follow-up question. How long does Um, let me ask it this way. How much time has elapsed in A's frame according to B? In other words, if B, during the course of measuring the event, looked out the window of the train and tried to observe A's stopwatch, how much time will have elapsed in A's frame according to B? What's the answer to that question, class? Seven seconds. False. I know that seven seconds seems like the obvious answer, but it's the wrong answer. But you have to understand the concept of why. Can anyone argue or think they can argue why B would not see A's clock as having elapsed seven seconds? Anyone remember the twin paradox well enough to do this? Anakin, do you know why? No. <laughs> Good. That means I'm finally going to teach you something. Anyone else? I just want to see if anyone knows or why. For observer B, it would seem like almost no time on the clock is ticked at all. Uh, I want to disagree with that. Three seconds is a measurable time. Okay, so then the three seconds. That's how long B observes for the event in his frame. 
You see, what's happening here is I'm changing the event on you. The event is no longer the laser beam. I could have worded this in a completely different way. I could have also worded this as suppose now that B is the observer, if he measures a time of three seconds, how long will A's time be? Now, let me explain the, the heart of this. It's about the relativity principle. Because, do you guys remember the top secret train gag? Yes. There's a reason I showed that to you. What happens in the top secret train gag? The, it makes it look like the train's moving when in reality the platform moved. Right. Val Kilmer was at rest and it was the platform moving. If you think about this, B is like Val Kilmer here. And B can easily argue that because the relative velocities are constant and because there are no accelerations or forces being involved, B can successfully argue, perverse as it sounds, that his train is at rest and it's the entire fucking earth and the train platform that is moving relative to him at a velocity of 90% the speed of light. If that's the case, B then becomes the observer and he needs to know that moving clocks are running slow where A is the moving clock. I know this is kind of, you know, convoluted thinking, but you just gotta work it through with me. So how do I figure out how much time has elapsed in A's frame relative to B? What do I do? Here is your formula. Your formula is the observer time is gamma times the rest time. So, so what am I looking for here? So observer B's time, in this particular instance, observer B's time would be the boost times. We already know the boost, so don't worry about the boost anymore. Yeah, okay, the boost is involved. Let me ask Riker, where do I put in B's time, there or there? B's time would be uh, on, the, on the opposite side of the equal from the boost. Y yes, it's the observer time now. Now, yeah. three set, in a weird way, we've swapped TA and TB in this scenario, right? Now it becomes like TB is gamma times TA because TB has now become the observer. So now we have three seconds is equal to three, uh, 2.3, right? Was it 2.3? Yeah. Okay. So how long will B say has elapsed in A's frame? Just over a second. Yeah, approximately one second. Okay, so which time is the correct description of events? Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's the right answer. Yes. Because all three times are valid descriptions. It's not like one time is right and the others are wrong. There are two observers, but unfortunately three times now. Okay? And all observers can claim authentically that their times are valid. Sometimes people want to get caught up in a question of application. Okay, dude, but how would they actually do this? Because this is, sounds kind of complicated. If you wanted to get real crazy on it, one could imagine a network of clocks. Let's see if I have this. I got a funky slide for you somewhere here. One could imagine a scenario like this, where you set up a bunch of stations at all these different coordinate points, each keeping track of clocks. The annoying thing is A and B would each need their own lattice work of ladders and clocks to keep track of. See, the problem is there's a clock at each space time point. And you've got to keep track of the running clocks in A's frame versus B frame. Okay, you know what? In practical reality, it would be annoying. But there are some confirming tests of this, and I'm going to get to that in a few moments. So don't you worry about is this real or not. By the way, it's totally effing real. There are three times. <laughs> and... Each observer thinks the other observer's clock is running slow because each observer thinks the other observer is moving and they themselves are at rest. 
I no, will point wrong. out that there is one time that every observer will always agree on, and that is B's time because B is in the same frame as the event. So if you know which frame the event is in, all observers will agree that B sees this event to take three seconds, okay? That's important. So the only times that actually change are the time of rest. Uh, no. The ex okay. Oh, sorry, Here's sorry. Here's what's fucked up. The rest time is usually the time that's not moving. Or, I'm sorry. No, I don't want to say that. The rest time is usually the moving time. It's weird. Here, B seems to be moving in the train, but B's time is the rest time, at least in the first scenario. Okay, this stuff is pretty messed up. What you got to do is you got to work some sample problems. In any case. Some wibbly wobbly timey wimey shit. Huh? Yeah. Um, some wibbly wobbly timey wimey shit. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is, sir. Okay. I have more sample problems that we can work, but remember, today we're going to be doing a problem set where we, we actually so do some more. So more problems are coming. Let's get back to the big picture view, okay? Does time change or just our perception of it? It The second is, one. It, no. Yeah. False all the way down the line. It is not simply a matter of perception. It is not a psychological effect. It is not a bamboozlement. It is a physically measurable effect. Okay, now we have to have a little history lesson here about um, the Hafili Keating experiment. One question that inevitably comes up during the course of a relativity lecture goes a little something like this. Is it real or is it just a psychological trick or is it perception? Um, and the answer to that question was made possible by a famous experiment done in physics known as the Hafili Keating experiment. But perhaps in order to help you appreciate the Hafili Keating experiment, we need to do the question that I proposed earlier. Now I know why we need to do that. So let's do one more sample problem and then I'll be able to explain the Hafili Keating experiment. I'm gonna erase all this. Is that okay, students? Yep. All right. Okay, here we go again. Same scenario as before. We're gonna do one more version of this. Um, a professor leaves his loft and takes a one-way trip to CCRI in his van at 11.25 a.m., okay? And in his rush to get to class, he travels at a velocity of 90 miles per hour, which, because we've got bigger fish to fry, Let's just use Google to convert that into meters per second real quick, okay? So unless any of you are faster than me, I'm going to do 90 mph to meters per second. That's 40 meters per second, okay? Okay. What kind of reckless professor would do this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly a person who is unfit for, for the duties entrusted upon him, okay? Meanwhile, some patient students wait at their desks, okay, for approximately 20 minutes, okay? So the time measured by the students is 20 minutes. Actually, let's do this from the professor's point of view, because that's what really matters. Let's say the professor, so the professor has a 20 minute journey to CCRI. How much time will lapse in the student's frame who are waiting patiently at their desks for the professor to arrive? Okay, we ready to do this? First thing we gotta do is we gotta calculate the boost. The boost is one divided by one minus the velocity as a percentage of the speed of light squared. So what percentage of the speed of light is 40 meters per second? Anyone remember the speed of light in meters per second? Should 
Jeez. No one knows what the value of C is in meters per second? 300,000? Uh, 300,000? That's kilometers per second. 300 million. Yes, three times 10 to the eight. Come on, dog. If you're not going to cooperate, you can get out. What's my percentage? Damn it, calculator's in the other room. It's 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7. Correct? You with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. We have to square that. Do you know what happens to really tiny numbers when you square them? They get very big. <laughs> totally fucking wrong. That's the opposite of the truth. They get, oh, they, they get smaller. smaller. They get smaller. So let's square that number together. Let's take our 1.3 times to the minus 7 and square it. What do you get now? You get 2 times 10 to the minus 14. Now, try to plug 1 minus 2 times 10 to the negative 14 into your calculator and watch what happens. What do you get? What just happened? The number's so small that it doesn't matter. The calculator can't handle it. But guess what? There is a calculator that is more powerful than the Casio FX260 Solar. Believe it or not, there's a calculator that is millions of times more powerful. Last and that calculator is called the brain. brain. Okay. Yes, Tim knew I was going. Okay. So we can figure this out. And here's the trick I'm going to use. Let's play a little game, okay? Imagine doing 1 minus 0 0.002. 1 minus, or let's do 1 minus 0.02 is 0 0.98. And if I do 1 minus 0 0.002, I get 0.998. That suggests that our answer should be 0 0.99999 out until we get to the 14th decimal place, and then there should be an 8. So let's write that down. So this is 1 divided by 0 0.9999999999, that's 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's what 1 minus 2 times 10 to the minus 14 is. And by the same token, if I do 1 over 0.998, I get 1.002, suggesting that what my boost is going to be is the, a one followed by 13 zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and the 14th zero should be a two. So class, how much time will have elapsed in the student's reference frame while the professor drives to work at 90 miles per hour? 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, let's try to do it. So if I do 20 minutes times 1.002, I get 20.04. Let me try that again. 20 times 1.02. 02 is 20.4. 20, 20 times 1.002 is 20.04. So it's the 13th decimal. So the answer would be that the students have to wait 
zero 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 one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and the thirteenth would be a four. That's how much time has elapsed in the student's reference frame. In other words, so an accurate statement of twenty minutes. Yes, exactly. In other <laughs> words, time dilation does not help me arrive to class on time at all, because it's still about the same length of time for both observers. That just means when you're speed when you're speeding down the highway to try to get somewhere, there's no point in speeding. You're not going to get there any faster. <laughs> well, I don't know if I go that far. I love my speeding. Now listen. There is a reason besides calculator trickery that I had you do this problem, okay? You gotta bear with me here. In theory, this would not be noticeable by a mortal human, but it is possible, especially after the, invented, the invention of the atomic clock, to measure fractions of a second down to hundreds of billions of a second. Remember, this was in minutes. So in seconds, there would be a, a, a higher, or rather a smaller precisional measurements there. So in the 1960s, people began inventing these, what are they, atomic cesium clocks, where they could measure time down to small, tiny billions and 10 billions of a second. And a couple of scientists got the nutty idea that maybe if they took two atomic cesium clocks that could keep track of time down to a hundred billionth of a second, they could put one clock on a Boeing jet and fly it around the world several times while the other clock sat on the tarmac and they could see if any time dilation resulted. The name of this uh, experiment is called the Hafele Keating experiment. So let me show you here. Hafele Keating experiment. And there's just such a cool picture associated with this that I want to show you. So here's the Hafele Keating experiment. Oh yeah, this is the photograph that I love. Okay, so bear with me here. So um, Hafele and Keating, uh, a physicist and an astronomer, took four cesium beam atomic clocks aboard commercial airlines. They flew twice around the world, eastward and westward, and compared the clocks against the ones at the tarmac. So here's a picture of the atomic cesium clock that they used, which could measure uh, time, uh, time intervals down to billionths of a second. And you got to just give it to the, this era here. This, this photograph is low resolution, but I want you to just look at it up close for a second. Obviously, they knew this was going to be a famous experiment. So they did a little publicity photo op for it. And here you can see Hafele and Keating, they're scientists, you know, this is kind of like a Mad Men era here. And they're, they're in their suits and ties sitting on the jet. And here's the stewardess who's probably serving them highballs the whole time that they're flying around the world, okay? And they've got the atomic clock sitting there. And they take this photograph for the history books and here's the stewardess just kind of glancing at her watch, right? And, and it's the most beautiful double entendre because the first message is, okay, yeah, we're on this plane and we're doing an experiment about time. But the second message is probably, this is really fucking boring because we're just sitting here on the plane doing nothing for hours and hours while we fly around the world, right? So it's just like a beautiful, like everyone's in on the joke and they're having a, they're, you can tell they're having a great time. These guys are probably a few cocktails in when they took this photograph. So as you can imagine, when the plane lands back on the tarmac, Sure enough, the clocks had elapsed differences in time that were exactly calculatable by time dilation. In other words, to a small fraction of a second, time actually was running slower on the moving airplane's frame. And this wasn't just perception, this weird ass shit was real. And by the way, this is not the only confirming test of special relativity we've had. Unfortunately, some of the others get a little more technical. Uh, there's one that's gonna appear in our homework today that took place at Mount Washington in New Hampshire where they measured uh, the decay time of muons coming from space. But those are an even longer story. And anyways, I wanted to tell you about the Hafele Keating experiment so that you would know we've actually measured these time differences and time dilation is 
actually happening, which is weird. Okay, now that I've flushed that concept out a bit, let's get to some of our other consequences of special relativity. Uh, may I erase everything here? Okay. Yeah. All right, so we saw that one of the consequences was time dilation. And time dilation says moving clocks run slow, whatever that means. And the equation is the observer time is gamma times t rest, okay? Now, I don't have time to prove all of the other consequences. I'm just going to list them and tell you about them. But as a sort of attempt to show you that having, having enough time, you could prove such things. Imagine in the same way that we watch lasers bounce back and forth in a clock. I could do a similar sort of experiment. Uh, do I have a picture of it? I thought I did. Well, if I did, I can no longer find it. Imagine that I watched uh, a long spaceship or a ruler fly past me. I can imagine a similar sort of experiment. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. I could imagine a similar sort of experiment where I, I took a, a laser beam and I bounced it from the back of the train car to the front of the train car and back as it rolled forward in time. If you allowed me to do this, and if I had an extra 30 minutes or so to perform this derivation, I could derive for you uh, a similar equation for distances. And the equation would look like this, and it's, it's called length contraction, and I showed this to you in our uh, labs last time. And this is probably the best uh, picture that kind of sums it up here. When you have moving objects traveling past you, moving frames will experience a length contraction where the length of a spaceship or a rocket that, that had some rest length would now be measurably contracted relative to an observer standing on a platform. So at slow non-relativistic speeds, under 20% the speed of light, the length of my van or my rocket would seem to be the same as it is at rest. But if I could go above 20% the speed of light, we'd actually start to notice a contraction in the length of my rocket or the length of my van. And this is another consequence of special relativity. It's called length contraction. Length contraction says moving rods or sometimes it's moving rulers shrink. And in terms of the boost, it's the observed length of your ruler is the rest length of your ruler divided by gamma. Length contraction is actually easier to conceptualize than time dilation because one can always be pretty sure which reference frame the ruler is in. If you are in the same frame as the ruler, then you will measure its rest length of whatever, 12 inches or something. In any other frame moving with respect to it, it'll appear contracted. Here's another consequence of special relativity. It's called mass increase. This one's pretty weird. Um, <clears throat> moving uh, masses, I don't wanna say grow, I'll just say increase. That, this phrase isn't quite as snappy, but the observed mass of something like a particle will be, it's, uh, it's the same formula as time dilation. An observed mass will grow by a factor gamma relative to its rest mass. Now, this equation is of extreme importance for the experiments that are done at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, you guys will remember we had a discussion of this once They use magnetic tubes, basically some fancy solenoids, to accelerate protons up to, let's check this out here. Uh, I want the wiki page for it. Here they're gonna tell us what fraction of the speed of light they can accelerate these particles to. 
So uh, bear with me Stop here. Kicking me. Hold on a second. I was pretty sure that somewhere in here they list what what percentage the speed of light they can accelerate protons to. Speed of light. All right, where is that? Oh, look at this, guys. They can accelerate protons to 0 0.999999990C. I wonder what the boost would be for that uh, for that speed. Here, I'm just going to punch it in in the interest of time. Wait, can I do this in my calculator? Probably not. Uh, one minus point nine 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 squared equals ship square root shift one over x. That's a boost of seven thousand and seventy one. <laughs> so basically, one of the reasons that the Large Hadron Collider can make these epic uh, forays into particle and nuclear physics it is because by the time you've accelerated a proton up to that speed, you're not just colliding one proton anymore. You're basically colliding 7,000 protons at once. And that's why when you smash these particles together in your detector, here's where the collisions actually happen. They actually, uh, I was hoping to see a picture of the analysis. This is what the analysis screens look like. You've basically just smashed 7,000 protons together and as a result, they bust open and all these subnuclear components come out like, like quarks and tetraquarks and tau neutrinos and all kinds of weird, wacky stuff. And by doing this, we can explore the nature of the strong nuclear force and learn more about the fundamental forces that control our universe. So it's Can you slow a photon down? Um, you cannot slow a photon down according to Einstein's postulates of relativity. A photon must travel at C, the speed of light. However, so they're probably much longer than we realize. Well, hold on a second. There is a way to artificially slow down a photon, and I'm going to go off the rails for a second. There's a kind of cool uh, TED talk or an experiment where these MIT, I think they were MIT oh. physicists, uh, used super high speed photography to, to watch the passage of a photon through a Coke bottle. And you actually can see all these relativistic effects. Now, I don't have time to show this to you, but if you want to, you can just watch the TED talk on them. Yeah, just, just, just quickly on that. Um, that was kind of a trick. They didn't actually use like super high speed photography. What they did was they shot the uh, photo the shot the beam through lots and lots and lots of times and then they used like uh oh um, yeah so i thought their so camera was some high-speed camera that can really, yeah no they just did this kind of um you know femtosecond imaging on the computer that captured you know a little a little bit further along each time they shot it and then they assembled all those frames into a video so they weren't actually following a single beam of light they were looking at different stages in a light beam that they shot like a, a million times you're muted professor Sorry, guys. Uh, I was saying this, one of the cool things about having my buddy Zaz chime in here is, is he's a veteran of MIT, and so he knows a little bit more about these programs that I do. Well, I'm trying to mute this thing. Um, so, Zaz, you're saying that they, they built up the image by multiple, multiple yeah, uh, yeah. imagings of this, and it, was it kind of like a statistical thing where they could sum many of these photographs to, or videos together? I don't think it was statistical. I think it was just that they had um, the ability to do this, uh, like sort of really precise timing of the capture. And so they could capture a little bit more each time. Um, oh, cool. You know, which oh, cool. normally like if you know, if you had to wait a 30th of a second in between captures, then you wouldn't be able to 
you know, if, if, your next, if your subsequent capture was a 30th of, um, of a second after the previous capture, you'd never see light moving because light goes a long way in a 30th of a second. Right. But if you can time these captures very precisely on each shot, and then you do it a million times, you can then assemble all these frames into this, basically, an it's an animation. Ah, uh, but from what I remember, you actually, what's happening. you actually could, you could capture some relativistic effects. I remember there was, there was some kind of effects of the way the shadows move forward and backwards along the table here. Anyways, mm -hmm. this, this, whatever it was, uh, it was, it was still totally cool. And for students who are interested in it, um, let me go back to my share screen again. I'll take that, uh, I'll take this URL and I'll put it into the chat. So it takes obviously like, you know, well, this is a two shoot, this is a two minute video, but I remember this guy had a, maybe a 20 minute TED talk where he kind of talks a little bit more about it. Uh, copy link address. And I'll put this into the chat. So if you guys are really feeling like nerding out on this, it's, it's kind of, um, where's that damn chat? It's kind of worthwhile. Okay, cool. Thanks for, thanks for chiming in Zaz. I love it when you do that. I want to, I want to get some expert, uh, opinions here. Okay, so mass increase, as I was saying, is yet another consequence of special relativity. And there are even more consequences of special relativity. One that's going to come up in our upcoming lectures when we start getting into neutron stars and black holes is um, because time dilation, uh, time dilation and length contraction are simultaneously happening, the coordinates in the space and the coordinates of time get kind of linked together into what's known as a four-dimensional space-time manifold. So in other words, before relativity, the coordinates of space, which were 3D, and the coordinates of time were completely divorced from each other. And it was assumed that all observers, no matter their motion, all measured the same rate of time flow. We know that is not true anymore. Uh, here's another way to think about it. If you artificially peg the speed of light to 300,000 kilometers per second, if that number is fixed and it cannot change, then you've in a sense created your own wacky conversion factor in which 300,000 kilometers is equal to one second, okay? And, and that right there is proof that space and time are now linked together. When I was fortunate enough to take uh, the GR course at Brown a couple of semesters ago for my promotion, uh, they actually, in, in, the, in an advanced GR course, they don't actually use seconds to measure the rate of time. They use units of meters to measure time flow, which is pretty hilarious. Um, you guys probably are aware of this uh, legendary equation, E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared, the derivation of that formula is itself another consequence of the two postulates of special relativity. Now the book has a little cute proof on it that starts with a uh, mass increase and uses a mathematical approximation. And there's a part of me that just wants to go full nuts on this thing and, and try to derive e equals MC squared for you. But honestly, I don't know if that would be the best use of our time just because Oh, egads, it's already 12.42 and I'm, I'm running out here. So <laughs> I'll save the derivation of E equals MC squared for another lifetime. But if you want to look into it, the book has a cute little mathematical insight. And it's amazing, it's amazing how quickly you can derive this formula just by assuming the two postulates of relativity. Uh, and there are some other consequences of relativity as well, uh, some that I won't be able to get into. I'll, I'll show you a quick slide of it right now. One of the troubles uh, about the Galilean transformation of velocity is we still need a way to add velocities if we have a situation where, you know, an observer in a spaceship or a supernova is traveling at relativistic speeds. And the, the solution is that the Galilean transformation of velocities has now been replaced with a newer superior velocity addition formula. And if you look at the mechanics of it, whereas before you would add the speed of the skateboard plus the speed of the tennis ball, now you have to divide it by a factor that kind of looks like gamma. Hey! Whoa! Mute that thing, Nate. What's good? Who was that? 
That was Riker. That was not the dog me. Saw the mailman. Oh, the, <laughs> that little dog ship. Is that two of them? Is there two of them there? There's two here. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. Well, the animals make this day go by better, so I, I still like it. Okay. Thanks, Riker. Um, you can see that you now have to divide your velocities by this factor that kind of looks like gamma. It's one plus the multiplication of the velocities of the speed of light. You know what? No one gives a shit about this. Let's spend just a couple of seconds here talking about general relativity. Now, <clears throat> I had intended for this day to be more about general relativity than special relativity, but I kind of went off the damn rails, so forgive me. Um, remember that relativity, special relativity, uh, in fact, I'm going to do this as a note because I think this is, this is noteworthy to write it down. Okay. You may remember from our previous lecture that Einstein's special theory of relativity, his two postulates, were proposed in the year 1905. And what makes special relativity special is that it is restricted to a domain where velocities are constant and when we are dealing with inertial reference frames, which I have abbreviated IRFs. So you can only consider the effects of time dilation and length contraction when passengers are moving with respect to each other at constant speeds. As we all know from driving cars, there is no such thing as a constant velocity anywhere. You have to go from being stopped and accelerate to get into motion. It's impossible to maintain a perfectly fixed speed. There will always be small warbles or variations around your velocity. Earth itself cannot be an inertial reference frame because it is a spinning coordinate system. And anytime you rotate, fict uh, fictitious accelerations Coriolis forces and centrifugal forces are involved. Earth is orbiting around the sun in a circle. The sun is orbiting around the galactic center in a circle. And even the galaxies themselves move and flow towards great attractors. The point is there ain't no such thing as a constant velocity. It's a fictional myth. But Einstein knew enough to know that even if your velocity isn't perfectly constant, even if you should be accelerating, there should still be effects of time dilation happening during an acceleration. It's not like time dilation just stops undergoing an acceleration. Those effects are going to be there. He took the next 10 years and set out to derive a more robust theory of relativity, one that would be able to handle and include accelerations. And what's awesome and legendary about Einstein is he set out to do this crazy thing and he actually pulled it off. He developed his more general theory of relativity and completed it 10 years later in the year 1915. What's interesting about general relativity is whereas he originally set out to form a theory about accelerations, he accidentally stumbled upon a new theory of gravity and he discovered that accelerations and gravity were linked to each other and that indeed these cool relativistic effects of length contraction and time dilation would still be happening undergoing accelerations, but now gravity was capable of doing them as well. Now, because my time is short, I'm gonna kind of talk you through a couple of albeit crappy slides and kind of prep you for our next week discussion of black holes and prep you for today's uh, office hours actually in which we're gonna do some kind of cool problems. Let me share my screen with you here. So I guess Albert Einstein's big insight into how to solve the problem of, of general relativity and accelerations came from him reading this newspaper article about some bricklayer and I don't know if he was in Dresden or Leipzig or which, Swiss or German town he was in, but he read this newspaper account of a bricklayer who had fallen from the top of a building and had this miraculous four-story fall and somehow the guy survived. And so it was a big sensation in local newspapers and they asked the bricklayer, hey, what, what did it feel like when you were falling four stories, presumably to your death? What was that experience like? 
And the bricklayer said, you know, honestly, I didn't feel anything at all. It was like I was weightless and floating free in space. And apparently this was a kind of eureka breakthrough moment for Einstein where he realized, holy shit, you know, according to Galileo, all objects are going to fall to earth with the same acceleration of 1g. So for instance, if you were an observer <clears throat> inside of an elevator in which the cord was cut, you and the elevator would kind of fall to earth at the same rate. And Einstein imagined, suppose we transpose this man in this elevator into deep space, far from the experience of any gravitational forces due to a planet. The person would float weightless inside the elevator in an almost identical way. And for the advanced student, I say almost because gravitational fields have tidal forces. That's the conundrum of relativity that we've never quite gotten away from. But in any case, to a first approximation, the experience of falling weightless in an elevator is almost identical to the experience of being weightless in deep space. And Einstein went one step further and said, no, they are the same. What's screwed up about this is in the left scenario, we are actually in the presence of a gravitational field. In the right scenario, we are not. And so somehow during a free fall experience, the effects of gravity become negated. This is what's now known as the principle of equivalence. And there's another way to explain it as well. The oh. book asks us to imagine two hypothetical, actually, <laughs> there's a kind of cool science fiction movie that I love. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but it's called Dark City. And in the movie Dark City, it's kind of like this goth uh, 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 sci-fi horror masterpiece. But there are, there are these experiments that are being conducted on these citizens who live in a Gotham-like city, and they're trying to figure out why things are happening weird. Like every day the buildings are get rearranged and people keep forgetting themselves. Dark City is kind of a cool movie. And at the end of it, the, the characters get to the edge of the, of the city and they break through the walls and they discover they're actually in an alien spaceship that's been disguised as a city. Sorry, I guess I just ruined that fucking movie for you. Anyways, okay, so imagine uh -huh. that you could find yourself in, in a similar scenario. The principle of equivalence would say, okay, let's imagine that you're sitting in a classroom in Earth. You are clearly pinned to the ground by gravity, which is tugging on you with an acceleration of 1g. Now imagine that you, dark city-like, cleverly disguise your classroom or you, you cleverly disguise your spaceship as a classroom and you put a student inside it. Provided that you attached rockets and you could thrust forward at a acceleration of 1g, the lamp and the chair and the student would all be pinned to the ground by a sort of artificial gravity, which was really just the floor of the spaceship smashing into your feet. But for all intents and purposes, you would feel exactly like you would on a planet. Here's what Einstein says is weird about this. On the left case, it's gravity causing the acceleration. On the right case, it's an arbitrary acceleration caused by the thrusters of your rocket ship. Einstein, in his principle of equivalence, takes this concept one logical step further and says, these two things are exactly the same. I don't give a shit that one is a gravitational field and the other is an arbitrary acceleration. They are the same. And he also claims that a free fall frame falling in an elevator is equivalent in all respects to weightlessness. Now you might well, wonder, it's, it's, it's kind of like, isn't it kind of like the space station, how it's falling and it kind of, they, they, they still have the zero gravity like um, experience. Yeah, they call it microgravity, but yes, it, 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 very much the same. The, uh, the ISS is in a free fall reference frame more or less. Yeah. Now, it's too bad because when I have time to work this out, I can actually do something fun. But the next question you're going to ask yourself is, well, how does any of this help me calculate time dilations and length contractions? Einstein set up this kind of clever experiment, and I don't, uh, it would be much nicer if I could draw this because this picture is not up to snuff. But we'll make this one of our last lecture points here today. This is probably worth doing. Let's imagine you have two observers, one which we'll call observer A, and observer A is sort of standing on the ground on a planet with gravity like Earth. 
And we're going to put observer B inside of an elevator that's undergoing a, a set of free fall. So I'm going to try to draw this a little bit neater because I think it will help me. So 20 centimeters and uh, another 20 centimeters. OK. So here are my two elevators. And I've got two observers. I've got one. I've got one observer on the ground, observer A, and another observer named B, who is kind of floating weightless in the elevator during his free fall descent to death. And what Einstein decided to do is he realized he could make this sort of quantitative by performing an experiment very similar to the one that we had inside of the train car. What we would do is we would take a laser and we would affix it to our our elevator at a height h above the ground and we would fire a laser beam in a straight line directly across the elevator and have it hit a height h above the ground on the other side so just as stupid as the first experiment was this one is just firing a little red laser beam across the bottom of your elevator some small height above the ground to an observer b who is experiencing weightlessness this experiment should look absolutely identical to one that was conducted in deep space, far from the effects of any gravity. In other words, the laser beam should start a height h off the ground, and it should travel in a completely straight line. But now imagine that you're observer A. And observer A is the only observer who's actually conscious of the gravitational field and the fact that the elevator's in free fall. Because it will take some measurable time interval for the start of the experiment and for the end of the experiment, in that interval of time, the elevator will have fallen some small distance in the gravitational field of Earth. The result of which being that if both observers have to agree that the laser beam hits the cart or hits the elevator at the other side at exactly the height h, then the observer A is going to witness the photon actually take a curved trajectory and move along a geodesic path in order for it to be able to strike the elevator at the proper height on the other side. In other words, whereas observer B sees the photon travel in a perfectly straight line, the observer A, aware of the gravity, will see the laser travel in a curved path. And there's something that's kind of off and weird about this. It seems to be that gravity is curving the photon, but gravity is not supposed to be able to curve a photon. Why not? Because photons, you will remember from an earlier lecture, are strictly electromagnetic phenomenon. A light wave is one part electric field and one part oscillating magnetic field. Neither the electric or magnetic fields are supposed to have mass, and because of this, they are not supposed to be subjected to the force of gravity. They're completely different forces of nature. And yet, once again, we see another pesky instance of where gravity and electromagnetism are somehow not as separate as we always assume they are. Here, the path of the photon is being curved by a gravitational field. Now, a lot of mathematics goes into general relativity, and there's a reason why I'm being a little hand wavy and wishy-washy about this. You usually need to use a type of mathematics known as tensor calculus to do general relativity. And tensor rel calculus is kind of like calculus, but not even in three dimensions or four dimensions, but in n dimensions. It can be an arbitrary dimensional space. That's something we just aren't prepared for at these levels of Bloody Marys and at uh, this hour of the day. But let me kind of sum up what the results are if you, if you, if you kind of get to the end of the rainbow here. What the curvature of that photon implies and what it means if you, if you go through the mechanics of it is that in general relativity, gravity is behaving differently than it did in our Newtonian world. Gravity now has a medium through which it acts and it is the four dimensional manifold of space time. And sometimes people use this kind of rubber sheet model to describe how masses are affected by gravity. 
In Isaac Newton's theory of gravity, gravity behaved by action at a distance, where the mass of the moon and the mass of Earth simultaneously talk to each other as if by magic. In Einstein's theory of gravity, we have the medium of space-time as an, uh, an interaction point. So uh, a mass of objects like planet Earth or the sun will bend and curve and warp the coordinates of space-time, and then orbits result as things like planets or stars or moons then try to travel in a straight line through the curved space-time, but just like that photon in the elevator, they experience an orbit as they move along the curved or warped space-time. So it's a, it's a two-part martini here. Mass curves space-time, that's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is the curved space-time tells other objects and particles how to move. And once we've learned this, we can see a million different examples of this happening in our everyday life. One of which is popular in science museums, like the Boston Science Museum, is the gravity well. And you can actually construct perfect Keplerian orbits just by rolling spheres. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. There's a, there's a nice one at the Boston Museum of Science, but there's a couple of others. Uh, gravity well, science, where's this damn thing? Ah, here we go. This is at the Hong Kong uh, Museum of Science. But basically they, they, take a, uh, they take a plastic funnel and they warp it and curve it with the, the same coordinates that, that would result from a mass in general relativity. And then you can simply kind of roll these ball bearings along the surface of this plastic funnel. And you can see that the ball bearings go into perfect Keplerian orbits. Now, eventually the ball bearings do in spiral into the center of the cone because they're constantly losing energy due to the friction between the ball bearing and the plastic funnel. But remember that in space, there's absolutely no friction between the planets and the space-time manifold. And without that frictional loss of energy, a planet will just continue to orbit the sun indefinitely on perfect Keplerian orbits. Now, I don't know if this is proof of general relativity. You need a little bit more mathematics to do that. But it's just a cool visual example of how we can visualize orbits as planets traveling through a curved space-time. Next time you're in the Boston Museum of Science, go to the Mathematica section and check this, uh, this exhibit out because it's, it's just fun and mesmerizing to watch these spheres rotate along the gravity well. Yeah, okay. the, the, uh, you, like people put like pennies and shit in them, right? Uh, sometimes, yeah, you'll see cheap carnival versions of them as well, but this, yeah. is, a, this is a finely constructed gravity well. Now, yeah. we're going to be using some of the results of general rel relativity in our lecture next week. And um, one of the ones that's going to, actually, we're going to do it in our homeworks today. One of the cool effects or consequences of GR that's kind of like a bizarro version uh, of what you see in, um, in special relativity is uh, there, is a, there is a formula for gravitational time dilation. It turns out that not only does motion cause clocks to run slow, but the presence of a powerful gravitational field warps the rate at which time flows uh, if you're deeper into the funnel. And I want you guys to take a look at the equation for time dilation because it's kind of cute. An observer's time, which is a time in deep space, far from any gravitational effects, will be altered from the rest time that you would experience at the surface of a planet by a factor that looks conspicuously similar to our gamma. It's one over the square root of one minus, but here instead of v squared over c squared, you have two gm over r. Now, do you guys remember where this equation comes from, from our earlier lectures? There's an equation that uses this exact sequence of variables, two gm over r. I don't suppose anyone's good enough to remember what that is. Escape velocity. Whoa, you guys are awesome. You're blowing me out of the water, too. That's right. So basically, think about it. The way gravitational time dilation works is it's just, it's like a normal boost or a normal gamma, but now you've reduced it by a factor of one minus the escape velocity as a percentage.
percentage of the speed of light squared, which is kind of a, I don't know, that's like an eerie similarity or an eerie parallel. And that means the formula for calculating gravitational time dilation is actually pretty simple and one that we can use in our homeworks today. Um, okay, whoa, I'm totally busted. I went way over my time slot. Guys, I get a little foamy at the mouthy when we start talking about relativity, so I apologize for that. But we are now well set up to do our, our office hours today. So I'm going to stop the recording.